So uh, I'm here today to talk about optimizing live view. And I think the title could be a little bit misleading because we are, what we are actually trying to do here is optimize the applications we build using live view to make it work the best way. It's already highly, I don't want to give the impression that I'm optimizing live view itself. So the first question we should ask is always, I mean, should I really care about it? After all, we don't want to do uh, optimizations unless we need it. So I would say that most of the time when you use a live view, especially because it is already uh, highly optimized, the answer is no. You usually don't need for most small applications, you're not gonna need anything. Uh, you don't have to worry about this. However, if you have applications that have pages that are highly frequent uh, updated, for instance, because it's sub uh, you're subscribing to a bunch of pub sub topics, and, or maybe the size of the payload on each of those updates, it's large. Uh, or maybe the, there might be some of the users with slow connection, or even all of them. So you probably should care about uh, optimizing your application. So before you, we jump into the, some of the examples, it's important to keep in mind two important concepts in live view, uh, which are chain tracking of component assigns and GIF tracking of templates, because those are gonna be the backbones of most of the optimizations uh, we're gonna be able to do. So this is a very high level overview of the process. There's much, much more going on, but for this uh, presentation, we, we're gonna assume that this is what's done by, by LiveView. So the first thing is LiveView is gonna split uh, the templates you create for your components or live views into static and dynamic parts. So whenever you use a component, instead of the component returning uh, just a string, it's gonna actually return a data structure. And this data structure is gonna hold the static and the dynamic parts along with other information uh, separately. And LiveView also gonna try to send, not gonna try, in the first one, after it gets the connection from the WebSocket, it's gonna send all that information, the static and the dynamic part to the browser. So it's also gonna keep track of changes in comp of the components. So every assign that changes, that those changes are gonna uh, get tracked by LiveView. And in case there are changes in those assigns, uh, it will try to update only the dynamic parts of the template, only the parts that are related to those changes. So it's a very optimized process. This is gonna be applied uh, in the whole template, including the child components. So, Tracking changes of assigns, if you're using live components as well as live views, it's kind of easy to track the assigns because the state is kept on the server. So in order to check if there are changes, you just need to compare the new state with the old state. For function components uh, that are stateless, uh, it's a different because since we don't have the state, uh, live view has a special assign, the change of assigns, uh, that will keep track of all those changes. Okay, so, and stateless components in LiveView, they are pure functions. So, as pure functions, they use the same optimization. A pure function, if you pass the same argument, it's gonna generate, if you always pass the same argument, it's gonna generate the same result. So, in a function component, a stateless component, is the same thing. If you pass the same values of all the attributes, it's gonna generate the same, it's gonna render the same thing. So if nothing has changed, it doesn't need to be updated on a browser. Uh, not sure if it's clear enough there, but just to have a visual representation of this. So this template, it's gonna be split. Like the first uh, chunk, it's gonna be static. There is no dynamic information there. And as soon as it gets the, the curly, uh, in this case, the template is a surface template, but if it's a live view, it would be the equivalent, which would be that, I don't know if there's a special name, but it's like uh, lower than, percentage, equals, and 
it's going to be the same thing. Then the dynamic part, and then another, uh, the other part is static again. So everything is going to be split, and on the after it gets the connection, it's going to send all those parts. So we can take a look at the demo here just to make sure get this. So if we go to the console, we're going to have the first rendering. And as you can see, you're going to have all the parts. You're going to have the dynamic part here. I'm not sure if it's big enough. Is it OK? OK. So from the second one, if I keep clicking in the counter, you're going to see that only this piece of the template is going to be updated, because that's the only thing that changed. So given that information, uh, we're going to try to set a few goals in order to optimize based on those information we have and how live it works. So the first one would be to minimize the dynamic parts because as, as you've seen, the static parts are all sent once and then they're not sent anymore. So all the information that are gonna be resend on each update is gonna be the dynamic update, uh, the dynamic uh, parts. So if you minimize the dynamic parts, you're gonna get some optimization. So one way to do this is to use components instead of function calls. Using function calls was something really common uh, before LiveView. Uh, and if you're converting a template, an old template to a new one, be careful with those functions because as I said, a function returns a string. A string cannot be diff tracked by LiveView. So if you convert it to a component, it will be able to track the static parts. So we have this example. It's basically the same example. But whenever I click the button, I'm actually bringing a message. If you take a look at the code. So I'm using a function here. So whenever the count gets incremented, since this is a function, the whole thing is going to be sent to the browser again, even though this part hasn't changed at all. So you can optimize this. If you translate this, and instead of using the function, you're using a function component. You see now that you're using the, the CGU F. If it's uh, not uh, a live view, you'll, you'll be using the age, the CGU age. So if you compare now with the optimized version, you're going to see that now only the dynamic part uh, it's coming to the browser. So this is huge, especially if you're translating old scripts into new ones that used to have, because if you're just using controllers, if you're, if you're using this in control, it's not a big problem because it's going to send a request only once. But if you're using live view, this might be critical. Another way to minimize those dynamic parts is to use CSS state area or data selectors instead of functions. So a common code we have in many uh, tutorials is like using a function to generate classes. There are libraries doing this. You probably have this somewhere. And this gets the same problem uh, as the example before. So I have this example that I can enable and disable. Uh, the button, if I click on the checkbox, and as you can see, every time I click the checkbox, all the classes are coming to the browser. So what you can do is, instead of using the function to calculate the, the classes, you can use the disable uh, attribute itself OK? And then instead of having to inject dynamic code here, we go, we're only going to have this piece of code, which is dynamically. And all the rest is going to be in the CSS, which is static. And it's going to be bundled in the application. It's going to be loaded first time. So this is a very nice trick. And it can save a lot of the payload, especially if you're using Tailwind, when you can have components with dozens of classes and 
if you have these components with hundreds of classes inside of for comprehension, uh, presenting hundreds of components, it can get messy. If you're using Tailwind, you can also use the variants. Tailwind comes with some default variants, including disabled. So you can use this strategy as well. If you, the, the first strategy is not uh, limited to Tailwind. You can use whatever CSS technology you want. But if you're using Tailwind, you can also use the variants. So instead of creating a class and, and having the state disabled to get different uh, styles, you can directly uh, use the variant here, and then it's going to be all static. But then it's going to be conditional to the value of the disabled attribute. Another similar case is when you have conditionals. It's common when you have a component, and the component has some kind of state. Uh, and you a bunch of things in your component, including child components, uh, child elements, has to, to display differently according to that state. OK, so we have a, an example here, which is a toast. And a toast could be a warning, it could be an arrow. So if you change the arrow, if you change the style, it's going to change. And as you can see here, the payload, whenever I change this, it's bringing a bunch of classes. The same thing as before. Because if you take a look at the code, we have a, a dynamic uh, expression here. And the goal right now is to minimize those dynamic parts because they are resent to the browser whenever the component needs to be re-rendered. So what you can do here is instead of creating those, uh, injecting those conditionals all over the place, you can have a single condition, a single uh, expression, which you can use the data. In this case, it will be the data kind. And that's the only dynamic part you're going to have in the component. Because all the other conditionals is going to be declarative. They're not going to be, uh, instead of being here in the code, in live view, they're going to be in the CSS. So you're going to have the basic things you have for the toast. But then if the kind is warning, you're going to be, uh, have a, a yellow background and whatever else you, you need. If it's arrow, you're going to have this. So you, you translate this dynamic part to a static part. And this works great if you have components that are going to be used inside for comprehensions and going to be uh, rendered hundreds of times. Uh, for context, everything that we're seeing here is actually things that we face at TimpleBet because uh, some of our applications, they, are, they need to keep information updated real time during the events. So at some, some of the pages have more than 1,000 of many of the components, and they update uh, many times per second. So we kind of have to face all those issues and tackle one by one. Uh, the same way as the before, if you use that solution is generic. You don't need Tailwind to do it. You can do it uh, with uh, plain CSS. But in case you're using Tailwind, another uh, nice way to do it, it's also to use uh, variants. But in this case, it's going to be arbitrary variants. Uh, I think this was released uh, in the latest Tailwind version. So you can actually, instead of adding this to the CSS file, you can add it uh, in line in the class. So you can say data kind equals arrow, and then you have the style. So this is always static. So there's going to be no conditional here. So no expression is going to be uh, evaluated. Only the, the single one in the top of the component. And one other thing that I think this is really nice, it's uh, you, you can even, with Tailwind, you can even use the group uh, syntax, which you can have like the at the root of the component, you're going to say that it's a group. And then you can, every children that needs to depend on that group, you can also uh, have the, the, the variant, the select. So, so it's going to be uh, a variant based on an information about uh, a node in a parent node. So the second goal uh, we have is to minimize re-rendering. Because uh, in function components, since we don't have the state on the server, we don't know 
uh, we don't know, uh, we, we always need to count on the, the, the changes that can be evaluated. So whenever there's a change in an attribute, it needs to be re-rendered, which means that the static part is not going to be rescinded, but the dynamic parts are going to be rescinded even if they haven't changed. Okay, so one way to, to, to avoid re-rendering of, of components is to pass only what the component needs. So we have a small demo here that is really basic. We have a user, like to simulate some kind of actor model, first name, last name, and the updated app. And we use a function component and pass the whole user. This is pretty common, and this is totally okay. Uh, because you're usually going to have this information, you're going to show it in a profile component, you're not going to get, a, you're not going to update this uh, a lot of times. But you have a different case when you have to update this uh, many times per second, and this is going to be in a four comprehension, thousands of components, you're going to see that here's the first rendering, and every time I update, the updated at, which is here, the name is sent again. So even though it hasn't changed, it's gonna be sent again on every request. And it might be a lot of stuff, depending on the, you know, your case. So what you can do here in this case, which I, I mean for user for most of the case, I don't recommend. I think it's totally fine to pass uh, larger uh, larger uh, data structures. But for this case, understanding how live view works, you need to know that if you pass this to a function component, even if the function component doesn't use one of the fields and the field chains, it gonna it's gonna re-render that component again. Not the static parts, but the dynamic parts, we're gonna be resend. So if you change this and pass the specific information you need, so the first name and the last name, instead of the whole user, So the same example now, whenever you click update, it's not gonna resend the name. Okay, so it's gonna change the, the, the updated app, but it's not gonna resend the name. Another thing you can do is to set, if you have computed values, like it's pretty common, and again, it, it, it's totally fine if, it, if, the, if it's a simple example, it's, it's a simple case, but sometimes you have information that is generated from other information. You have attributes passed to the component, and then you're gonna get that information, gonna calculate some other information, and gonna render. It's common to create a function, and then receive that information, calculates in line. So, like this one. So this example, It's the same counter, but this time I have a message that whenever the counter is multiple of five, it's gonna change the color. Okay, so if we take a look at the payload, you can see that even for this component, even when it doesn't change the color, the color is gonna be resend. So you can see here, gray, 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 gray. And it should because it hasn't changed. But since the implementation is a conditional here, and you're using count in the conditional, so live view checks the expression. Is there anything that changes in that expression? Yes, then it needs to re-render that code. So in this case, since we're calling a function and the count has changed, even though the result of the function hasn't changed, it's gonna be re-rendered. So we can fix this by actually, instead of using the function inline in the template, we can actually create a new uh, data, a new assign, and that assign is gonna be updated separately, not inline in the template, but it's gonna be calculated and then gonna be set in the socket assigns. So in this case, now, it's different because now, if the function returns the same value, the assign is not gonna change. If your sign doesn't change, it doesn't need to re-render. So if, if, if you go to the optimized version, you see that 
Now, only when it changes, it's going to send. So whenever it doesn't change, it's going to keep it. And then when it changes, it's going to send just what it sends. So this is a trick that might be important, depending on the case. Be aware that whenever you're using functions inside the templates, it's always a, a red flag. It might be fine for simple cases, but you never know when you're going to reuse that component. Sometimes you use a component, you're going to just place it once in a page. But then somebody can use that component, and then it's going to have like thousands of instances. So if you want to avoid this, try not to use functions inside the template that calculates values. Calculate the value, set an assign specific for that, and go with the assign. And the last goal we have uh, to get even better optimizations is not directly related to what we've seen so far. But at the end, it's going to be because we need to even if you do all those optimizations, that might be the case that your live view just receives too many messages, like PubSub messages, and you are updating the socket on every message that comes. So this is common. And the tricky part is that usually if you do this in development, you're never going to notice. Because, I mean, even if you try to send thousands of messages per second, you're locally so it's going to be fast. And Phoenix is amazing. I mean, it's, it spoils us in a way that you just think it's going to work like this in production. And so there are two ways to, to handle this. The one is to minimize the number of messages. Don't send too many messages. That updates the socket. That should be like the goal number one. Because you need to understand that a viewer, a user, will not realize changes in less than 100 milliseconds or so. So there's no point in sending information to the browser on every millisecond, because it's not going to be not noticeable to the user. And there's nothing that protects us doing this in Phoenix. You're just going to have a topic. You subscribe to a topic. You're going to receive messages. You're going to update the socket. Locally, it's going to be really fun. But if you go to production, what might happen is that if a user has, has a slow connection, things can get really messy. Um, so this is a small demo. And for this demo, it's I'm simulating a PubSub here. So I created a gen server, and the gen server sends uh, mes one message uh, for each uh, millisecond. And then I update those 40 uh, texts. OK? And <clears throat> locally, it's going to be Probably fine. Oh, sorry. Spoiler. <laughs> Here we go. So that's Phoenix. I was, I was kind of OK. That's Phoenix, OK? One millisecond, you can update 40, even more. You can 100, even 1,000, I don't know. It's really fast. And if you take a look at the observer, I don't know if I can. If you take a look here, you see there's nothing unusual there. No memory consumption uh, out of the normal. So what are you going to do now? It's try to simulate a user with a slow connection. So the first thing you notice is that visually it gets pretty much slower. But that's OK. I mean, it's a slower connection. You could expect that. But that's not the worst part. The worst part is that if you come to, to Observer now, you're going to see there is a process that is starting to accumulate messages in the queue. And this is going to grow unbound, because it's not going to keep up with the number of messages. And it's going to keep accumulating those messages. And the memory is going to explode. The live view is going to crash, which is the best case scenario. Uh, worst case scenario, if you have many users, it's going to consume all the memory the VM can. And so this is tricky. I mean, from, from all the cases we've seen so far, I think this is the trickiest one because it's probably going to happen in production because you usually don't test uh, these kind of things uh, for slow uh, connections. And this is fine when the only, the only person that actually uh, has a problem is the user, the single user. But in this case, as you can see, as, cons as it consumes 
resources in the server, the, 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 the side effect can be much larger. So what can we do uh, in order to, to fix this? is to batch the, the, the messages, okay? So in, instead of just receiving everything you have from PubSub and updating the socket, because it works locally and Phoenix is great, just batch the messages. In this case, I created a batcher that you can use as a, as a hook. So if you have a batcher, uh, you can say the maximum number of, of messages is gonna batch and a timeout. So if you don't receive that number of messages in the timeout, it's gonna send anyway. Okay, so it's the same code and you can see the difference is minimal. So this is, this is the original one, is the handle info getting all the messages and updating the socket. And the other one, it's basically the same thing, but now it has a handle batch and it's gonna reduce over the socket before sending the socket, uh, before informing LiveView that you're ready with the socket, okay? Don't, don't, don't send any updates right now. Let me reduce all those results to the socket. Many of those uh, changes could be applied and then maybe another change can actually undo that change. So what matters is gonna be what happens after those, the end of the, 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 the list. So with this simple strategy, you can use the same example no spoilers this time. So this is like the same as normal. And then if you simulate this low connection, you don't even notice visually because actually instead of sending all that information per millisecond, it's holding, keeping its time and then sending everything as batches. So it has only one update instead of 100 updates. So visually, you have the benefit that is a way better experience for the user. And if you take a look at the at observer, you're gonna see that it backs to normal. So I think this is this was uh, I think this is the trickiest one, and this, that's the one that you probably need to be more careful. Uh, if you have this kind of system, real time system, receiving bunches of messages and updating the socket. So there are other opportunities for optimization, including some new stuff, but I don't want to spoil Chris' uh, presentation. So he's gonna be responsible, I think, for introducing this. But since you're on a topic, I'm just gonna mention it because they're already there. So the new JS exec uh, function, it's really nice because if you have the same case when you have a bunch of uh, elements, calling JS functions that generates JavaScript, even if they call the same function, the same thing, everything, they're gonna duplicate that code. So if you have hundreds of components, you're gonna have all that duplicated. And some of those codes can be a little bit large. With the JS exec, you can have a, a, a unique place to have that code, and you just call the, the JS exec in all those other places. So you're gonna save some payload. You have also the new icon core component uh, if you generate with the new uh, Phoenix 1.7 uh, that instead of injecting the whole SVG, which is bad for live view, because if you want to change that, it's gonna change it again, the whole, picture, the whole uh, image. It's gonna create classes and the only thing that changes if you are dynamically changing that image is only gonna change the name of the class instead of the whole SVG. The SVG is gonna be sent previously uh, as CSS. And the new support for streams, if you want to save uh, memory on a server, is gonna be great because if you have lists and if you want to show that list, and you don't, ha you don't need to keep that list on a server to do anything uh, with the whole list, you can use the stream to add uh, and remove items from the list. So you don't have to keep the whole list on the, on the server. So I, I'm pretty sure Chris is gonna go deeper on those. So that's what I have for you. And as I said, you're probably not gonna need this all the time for all the applications. You don't have to implement all of those techniques, 
Uh, but pay attention that, especially when you're using four comprehensions, uh, rendering too many instances of the same component, it's important to know how things work under the hood, so you can, if needed, you can use one of those techniques. Some of them are actually be best practice, in my opinion, and some others should only be done when needed. Thank you. Cool, so yeah, thank you. Uh, we only have time for one question, um, so yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, my question is, so when you were showing that example and you were throttling your connection to like a slow 3G connection, uh, that could be used intentionally if I want to ruin the server, right? So you should do it all the time. Because uh, as, as a... Are you testing you should keep it always? No, 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 no. What I mean is you should always do what you did of, uh, with the batching because a malicious user could otherwise intentionally try to crash your server and slow it down for everyone else. Open a few connections, boom, very slow bandwidth, and then you're, you're screwed. Problem. I mean, I don't know if there is another way to prevent that. And in our case, most of the applications are... We we no, we, oh, sorry. <laughs> we have a, a limited number of users, so it's not unbound. The number of users are not is not unbound, and they are kind of trusted users, okay? So, I mean, you can, you, you, you always uh, be, I mean, I, I think you should always try to do this, but only if you have this kind of implementation, like you're gonna render a bunch of things, if you're gonna handle, uh, I don't know, <laughs> one piece of information here, and out of there, and you're gonna update after a minute or so, <clears throat> I don't think you should bother doing that. But whenever you have, Especially PubSub. If you're using PubSub, be careful because you can have that kind of problem. Cool. Thank you. So yeah, let's thank Marlis again for, for this great talk. Thank you.